impossible to go any further. And when they saw the soldiers coming out, they began to freak out. Ah, you brought us out here. You know, speaking to Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. It would have been better for us to stay. Well, now I guess we know what's in your heart. And God said, back. well, see, now I know what's in your heart. And Moses calmed down. No, no, stand still. And this was the whole point. Do you trust me or not? Stand still and you'll see the salvation of God. You really want to turn back? You really want to go back to your lives of slavery? Wherever you are in your Christian life, God is speaking and saying, stand still and see the salvation of God. You can't change your circumstances. You, ch- you can, you know, maybe if you go about changing this and changing that, you, you wiggle your way out of it. Let me tell you something. God will create that circumstance all over again. Although he, he won't drop it. This is the thing I've noticed about God. He does not drop it. With God, drop it. No. Who do you trust? There's an army coming. They're going to kill us. No, they're not. Trust me. Trust me. Now, look, look at the next verse, Deuteronomy. This is kind of a summary of what God was doing with the children of Israel when they were in that whole long period of the desert. It says, all the commandments that I commanded, command you today, this is a looking back, huh? we're in the book of Deuteronomy, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give uh, to you and your fathers. Now listen, you shall remember. What shall you remember? Very interesting. You shall remember all the way, all the way, the road, the, my dealings with you. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you. First thing, that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So all of these little things that God engineered, well, big things often, (laughs) God engineered in the wilderness to humble them, to make them know hunger, everything. God did it for a purpose. God did it to see and to know what was in their heart. He humbled you and he let you be hungry. That's not my God. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ. Well, there may come a time when he lets you go hungry. Because he's got something else in mind. And fed you with manna, which you did not know. So a supply that you had absolutely no idea about. Nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man make you understand. That man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was the purpose of God leading them through the wilderness in crazy ways that they couldn't understand. From one trouble, one problem, one difficulty into another. Testing, proving, trying their hearts. Why? To bring them to a place where they would rest in him. See, he was bringing them to the place of rest. The promised land, rest and blessing and power. And they resisted him at every step of the way. Every step of the way, they resisted God. Now, I'm going to have to probably do this briefly. But I want to use the life of a man to show you how God will hem you in. Do we need to stand up for a second? Miss Pat was showing me some wonderful things about classroom control. I mean, this woman has got it down. You've got 150 kids in the room, and over there, you know, they're, they're not maybe as well-trained, and they're getting up every couple minutes, and they're running right down, and they're running right in front of us, all just going out to the bathroom, buying their, buying their little, uh, what do you call it, popsicles and stuff, and then running back in, and, and they're up and down and moving in and out. And all of a sudden, Miss Pat, one finger. No, 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 two fingers. 
How many fingers do I have up? Two fingers. Put your hand up. How many fingers? One finger. And those kids, man, just like a dog lying down, they just calm down. And for about 10 minutes. And then she'd get that finger out there again. I, it, was like, it was like magic. It was like, wow, how do you do this? It was amazing. Do we all need to stand up for a second so we can focus? Go ahead, stand up for a second. Come on, let's do it. Oh, don't just look at me like, uh, we're not children. We ought to be children. We ought to be more like children. There you go, Paul. I like that. Two, two, one. Sit down. Uh, uh. Sometimes we must exercise patience for the message and with the messenger. <laughs> yeah. <We're, laughs> yeah. Whatever. The Super Bowl is until six, so calm down. You can you can gorge yourself, you know, later. Let us gorge ourselves on the word of the Lord now. We're going to look at a man who had some of the most incredible qualities in his life. He was a man who knew God. He was a man who was, I would say, cold stone honest. He was a man who was absolutely decisive. When he decided on something, he carried it out. And he possessed all of these qualities in the wrong way. He knew God, knew his word, knew his heart. He was decisive. He was honest with God. All in the wrong way. The name of this guy is Jonah. We're going to look at the life of Jonah in three different scenes because I just want you to see how God worked in his life to bring him to the place that he wanted. Now, there's the overriding idea of Jonah where God was working to deliver the Ninevites, and he was demonstrating by that, you know, that God is a God of all the nations and that he wants all the nations to know him. But there is also kind of like a parallel story running in the life of Jonah himself, which becomes for us today a model uh, uh, to help us to understand how it is that God works in our lives. We see that God speaks to our heart, that God reveals to us his will. He shows us who Jesus is. But, but that's not enough, folks. He, it's not enough just to get it up in the head. It has to somehow get from head knowledge to heart knowledge. And the way that it gets from head knowledge to heart knowledge is through the circumstances of life. It's when we get ourselves into a corner, or God, as we shall see, God puts us into a corner. He begins to minister that word to us so that we embrace it and and it becomes a part of our lives. We're going to look at his life and see how the Lord did these things and hopefully uh, glean. Now, yeah, there was, I knew that there was one thing that I forgot. He was a, there was four points. He was a man who knew God. He was a man who, who was uh, honest before God. He was also a very passionate man, an extremely passionate man. You'll see what I mean by that. He was an extremely passionate man, and he was also a very decisive man. But like I said, all in the wrong way. Let me give you an answer. He told God, for example, that he hated his plan. Stone cold on it. God, you know, I hate your plan. I don't want to do your plan. He says that he was angry with God because God had this plan. He ran from the presence of God. So he wasn't a guy that, you know, that just kind of, you know, when he decided something, he acted. He was honest. He was passionate. He was burning. The Bible, you know, that word anger, it, it, literally, it's burning. He was burning but all in the wrong way, all in the wrong way. He he was missing one thing, and God wanted to give him that one thing. Now, we look into the life of Jonah, and the very first thing that we see in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, now these aren't going to be up here. So it says here, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of 
Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So this is the word of the Lord. This, and, and it's not just, you know, go there. This, there is much that is included in this word because it's going to engage the heart of the prophet. He's going to have to put this word in practice, and it's not going to be something plastic that he's just going to get up and, you know, run down there. Why? Because he's involved. He has feelings. And the word of the Lord is going to come to him and it's going to try him and it's going to test him. And we see it in the very first scene here. This is the beginning of the very first scene in Jonah's, in Jonah's experience with the Lord. Yet you have to remember is, this guy's a prophet. You have to remember, this guy knows God. He knows the voice of God. And the first thing he does when he hears his new commission... But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship that which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down in it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We're talking about a decisive man. I don't like what you're doing. I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm out of here. He fled from the presence. Now, don't be looking at me with that sanctimonious little thing like, like, I would never do that. You have done it. And you are probably doing it. You don't know my heart. No, that's true, but God does. God does. And I know my heart. <laughs> I know that there are moments when I flee from the voice of God. I know that there are moments when I stick my fingers in my ear. <laughs> What did you say? Can't hear you, Lord. We play that little game with God. Can't hear you. Didn't hear you. Don't want to hear you. Or, or, you're all looking at me like I'm maybe the only one who's ever done that. Yeah, you're with me. I know that. Two peas in a pod. Running from God. This is what Jonah did. He ran from the presence of the Lord. This was his decisive decision. When God spoke to him, he ran from the presence of the Lord. But do you think the Lord said, well, there goes another wacky prophet? He goes, ah, no, 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 I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you. And it says in verse 4, this is where, you know, some of our theology gets a little goofy. It says in verse 4, and the Lord. That didn't just happen. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. Whoosh! Right in the direction of who? Jonah. The Lord hurled. You, you, try to, you think God doesn't want to mess up your hair with his hurlings? He will hurl as he desires to hurl. And he will hurl freely in your direction when he's got something to accomplish. It's not just to mess you up. It's not just to confuse you. It's for a reason. And this is where it comes, you know, the, the, the real crux of faith. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. It's not just the good like Job said. Shall we, shall we only receive good at the hand of God and not evil, not difficulty, not problems? God works in us often through the difficulties of our lives. Why throw away a good experience with bad theology? No, God doesn't use any of that. Well, the Lord hurled. <laughs> you discuss it with the Lord. The Lord hurled a great... No, there's a different translation. No, this is the translation. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break. How many of you ever gotten to the point where you felt like you were about to break? Oh, but God didn't have anything to do with that. Well, maybe he did. <laughs> maybe he did. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. And they threw the cargo which was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen asleep. <laughs> I don't know about you, man. This is a paradox. This is a guy with great faith in God, but yet won't obey him. This is a guy who goes to sleep while everybody is you know, watching this ship fall apart. 
you know, the, the mast is falling. The, it's breaking up. They're all crying to their God. They're all doing what they can. Where, do, where is Jonah? <laughs> Saw on logs. Saw on logs. He's asleep. The captain of the ship is so frustrated with him. He comes to him and he says, the captain approached him and said to him, how is it that you're sleeping? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps your God will have concern about us so that we will not perish. They were going down. The captain knew it. And there's Jonah. And so they all get upset. These are all, these are all people who had their little gods, you know. These are idol worshipers and so on and so forth. So they all begin to call on their God. Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll hear you. Who are you anyway? Well, I'm an Israelite, and I fear the Lord God. As soon as he told them who he was, where he had come from, and what he had done, because the Bible says that, that just previous to that, he saw, you know, I'm, I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He told them. It's not like it was an accident. He determinedly fled from the presence of the Lord, and he's boasting about it. This is a prophet. My daughter was telling me, prophets are nuts. I said, thank you, dear. Prophets are crazy. Crazy like a fox. Crazy in the sense that they know God. And this guy knew God. He knew God. He knew him better than we know him. Instead of repenting at that moment, <laughs> what does Jonah do? Just throw me into the sea. He would have rather died than to change his opinion. He preferred death. Huh? He preferred death over repentance. This is one stubborn dude. And have you ever been there? Don't look at your neighbor. Get that mirror out. I prefer death. This guy was passionate. <laughs> Just kill me. Throw me overboard and the seas will get real calm. They didn't want to do it. No, we don't want to do it. And they tried, but they couldn't do it. The hand of the Lord was too strong. And Jonah says one thing. He says, I know. This is God. I know. Let me get it for you here. Where am I? Yeah. Verse 12. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on my account, or on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. I know God's in it. He knew. He knew what God wanted. He knew God was coming. But, but what did he say? Just throw me into the sea. I'll take my chances. I prefer death over life. I prefer death over repentance. I do not want God to do what he wanted sent me to do. But, as we know, and they, they threw him over, the seas became calm, but God was not finished with him yet. He didn't let him die in the sea. What did he do? Another circumstance, another situation. It says God had already prepared a great ship, a great fish. And the fish came by right when Jonah got thrown into the sea, and oh! Now, some people want to look at that as though it's just crazy fairy tales. Well, I believe it's absolutely true. The Lord Jesus Christ believed it was absolutely true that a fish, large fish, swallowed a man. Now, that's an amazing thing. <laughs> Any of you ever been inside a fish? It's very funny, actually, the way he talks about it. He says here, uh, well, that, that comes a little bit later. But from that particular place, when God has gotten him now into the second place, three days and three nights, into the belly of the whale, it says, from the belly of the whale, he cries out. From the belly of the whale, he realizes it's about over. I can feel the acids. I am starting to, you know, <laughs> be digested. There's no other way to say it. He was being digested. And he cried out to God. And he cried out for mercy. And he cried out for God to be kind. And as soon as he cried out, the Lord, it says that the Lord heard him and delivered him from that great place. 
and he came out from the fish, and he just, he, he's very graphic. He says, and there was seaweed wrapped around my head. Can you imagine? Seaweed wrapped around a guy's head, middle of a fish, praying. Oh, God, have mercy. I mean, you got to get this in your mind. I mean, this is, it's funny, but it's sad. Here is this great prophet who knows God, who's running from God with all of his heart. God finally stops him. He's not done with him yet. He regurgitates him out onto land. And as soon as he regurgitates him out onto land, that's the end of scene one, what happens? God speaks to him again. He didn't change his message. Note that. He did not change the message. He said, Now that I've delivered you, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. Go and preach to that that nation. It's in chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am telling you. This time, it says, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city, three days' walk. And it says, Jonah began to go through the city, one day's walk, and he cried out and he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. God is going to judge you if you don't repent. And what we know is that the city did repent. The people repented. So, we see God taking Jonah from running from the call, running from God, running from the presence of the Lord, to obeying him. Now, for the most of us, that would be enough. But it wasn't enough for God. Because look at Jonah's response to what God had done. It says in chapter 4, verse 1, after God had delivered them, after God had seen their repentance and, and repented himself of judging them, it says, but it greatly displeased Jonah. And he became angry. It's... How many of you get angry when God gives you success? Jonah did. God delivered them. God had mercy on them. God loved them. And Jonah was extremely displeased. And he became angry. How angry did he get, I wonder? And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord... Was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, in other words, to stop you from from having mercy upon them, um, I said while I was still in my own country. Therefore, to install, I'm sorry. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew, I knew that thou art a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. I knew you were going to forgive him. I knew it. Because he knew him. Then what does he say? Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For death is better than life. Second time he's asking God to kill him. Now, if you think he's not serious, don't think he's not serious. He is serious. It is better for me to die than to embrace mercy. The prophet of God, the decisive one, the one who knows God, the passionate one. Yeah, he's passionate, all right. He's burning with passion, but all in the wrong way. But God's not done with him. There's Jonah stewing. Kill me. Just get it over with. Take me out. I've had it. I'm done. God said, well, you might be done, but I'm not. Again, the Lord speaks to him and he says, second time, second word. Do you have a good reason to be angry? Isn't that like God? I mean, yeah, just cut through it all. Do you have a good reason? Can you, can you tell me why you're angry to the point of wanting to kill yourself? Then Jonah went out from the city. I love this. He went out from the city and he sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. 
I think he was thinking, well, maybe God won't show him mercy. Maybe God will just destroy him. I think he really had that intent in his heart. This is not a man who shares in the sentiment of the heart of God. He went from running from God, he went to obeying God, but he still doesn't share the heart of God. Do you see what I'm getting at here? But God is relentless in his pursuit of Jonah's heart. He wants him to become a man like him. This is the making of a man right before our eyes. And then it says, so the Lord, here we go, God with, God with his providence again, you know, working circumstances, putting Jonah back into the corner, just working him back into the corner. So the Lord appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to be shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. <laughs> well, you would be too if you're out in the desert burning with heat. But God appointed a worm. When dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. And it came about when the sun came up that God appointed a scorching heat. So here we have God appointing the plant, and then appointing the worm to destroy the plant after Jonah has been taking such delight in it. You think God won't do this in your life? Wake up. He will do it. And then he will send that scorching eastern heat and make you real discomfited. Backing you into the corner. Divine providence, the hand of God, hemming you in, working you in, so that he can work himself into you. The sun came up to each, and it beat down on Jonah's head, so that he became faint, and he begged. Listen to this, third time. He begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Third time, Jonah is seeking death. Instead of simply submitting to the heart of God, embracing the heart of God, just kill me. I'm a miserable wretch. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to embrace your mercy and your love. Just kill me. Passion. That's passion. Misguided. But it's passion. It's honesty. Stone cold honesty before God. Now God has the last word. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? You're mad about the plant. You're mad that I killed the, you're mad that I saved the people. Now you're mad about this plant that I killed. Do you have a good reason? Again, with that question. Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have a good reason to be angry even unto death. He's talking to God, people. He's talking to the one who holds his life in his hand. You understand what I'm saying? I have reason good enough to want to die. So bring it on. This guy was serious. Stone cold serious. He wanted to die four times. He tried to make it happen. And God just, you know, oh, I love you, Jonah. You're a wild man, but I love you. And I want to give you my heart. I want you to know how I feel on the inside. I have good reason to be angry even unto death. And the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow which came up overnight and perished overnight. One day the thing was there. And this is the question, and this is where God wanted to bring him. And should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left? Shouldn't I have compassion on 120,000 people who don't know their right from their left? And Jonah, if that's not enough to touch your heart, don't forget about all the animals. That's hilarious. 
and many animals. Why does God add them and many animals? The people, 120,000 people are going to die. And the animals. Because it seems as though he had more, kind of like the folks today, you know, more compassion for a tree and an animal than for human beings. That was a pretty good one, wasn't it? I never thought about that before. Here's Jonah, the nature man. What do they call those folks? Tree hug, well, <laughs> the tree huggers, which it's good, you know, for us to take care of God's creation, all that, not against that. But man, you know, if you got more compassion for a plant and an animal, Pastor Terry and Pat have seen all those folks in, in India, you know, they're yeah, kind of crazy. And then, notice that there's no ending. We don't have a romantic American ending where everything turns out great. You know, all of our movies, you know, the hero always wins. And we don't have a French tragedy where it always turns out bad. Ah. If you've ever watched a French movie, it's like, oh, bummer. Oh, man. You know, we want realism. He doesn't tell us the ending. Why? Because he's speaking to people who are still in the process. I said this to my wife, and she says to me, well, that would be anticlimactic. And I said, oh, yeah, you got a point there. It's an ongoing story. You see? It's an ongoing story. You're Jonah. I'm Jonah. God, the creator of all the ends of the earth, who knows exactly what he's trying to do in our lives, is at work in our hearts. And he is using circumstances. He is using his word. He is using other people. He is using every means that is available to him to get us to the place where we embrace his heart, where we feel what he feels for the hurting, for the dying, for the lost. I don't, I'm not here to, to say where you are or to condemn you where you are or to pat you on the back where you are because I know that God wants to bring you even further, even further. And this is the thing, further, farther. Even this, this is the very thing that God wants, your open-ended life in his hand, trusting in him at all times, trusting him at all times. There's a story that Jesus told about a man, a rich man, who had a servant. And uh, he stole from him much money. And it was found out, discovered, and he, he, the, the, the master said, okay, sell everything, everything that he has, his children, everything, so that payment can be made to me. But it says that the guy fell down at his feet, and he said, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, and I will pay you everything that I owe you, which he could have never paid it. It was too much. And it says that that master forgave him. But as soon as he got up, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him ten bucks. And he said, oh, did the same exact thing. Fell at his feet and said, just be patient with me. I'll pay you the ten bucks totally within his means. Another week and it would have been done. And the guy said, no, I'm throwing you in the jail. And the other servants heard about it. And the master was distraught. And he finds this servant and he says, I forgave you all that debt. And yet, when it came to be your turn to forgive, you couldn't do it. You didn't know my heart. You didn't know how to forgive after I had forgiven you everything. We're like that. God forgives us all, all, and yet we want to hold on to some of the most minute, foolish, and silly little piddly details of life. Why is that? Because like Jonah, we haven't yet captured that heart of compassion. God is working in you. Matt, come on up here, Matt. I, I, I know we're a little over. I told you to be patient. You know, hey, if you need to go, that's fine. Go ahead and uh, we'll dismiss you right now.
but I believe that there are some people that God really wants to touch and uh, minister to at this moment. So please feel free to go. Take that word with you. Apply it in your lives, in your heart. Let God, let God work himself into you. Huh? Let him work himself into you. And as, as we're, we're just going to just worship the Lord for a moment uh, and, and call upon him in, in, in song, call upon him in prayer to work that work. So that we're not like Jonah. (laughs) Well, maybe, I guess it's okay to be like Jonah. We're all in that process. But uh, I would encourage you to read the book of Jonah. uh, Let it astound you that a man can be (laughs) so hard-hearted. And yet, God is relentless. The patience and mercy and faithfulness and love of God towards the hard, most hard headed individuals that live on the face of the earth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because you know what? I'm one of them. I, it takes a lot to convince me. It takes a lot, you know, to, to, to break me down and, and move me in another direction. And I thank God that he has that power in my life to be able to do it. And he's got it in yours. He's calling on you today to recognize his work in your life. He's calling on you today. Go ahead and stand up and